G'day and welcome to Express Lane, a podcast for small business owners and franchisors to better navigate the trials and tribulations of growing a successful company. It isn't easy, but the rewards are definitely worth it. So Express Lane is bringing you industry leaders who share their wisdom and give you support in kicking your small business goals this year. Our guest today is Sam Carson from Asai Brothers. Uh, Asai Brothers is a business that grew quickly and has turned into a successful franchise business. The thing with Sam is it doesn't really ever stop there. With one area of focus and while continuing to grow Asai Brothers, he spotted the need for customers to access videography and content marketing uh, at a more scalable cost and has established a business uh, with some others called Insider Media. So today we're going to chat with Sam about how he spots new opportunities and how he juggles the challenges of a new business while keeping his eye on what's happening in his existing ventures. Sam, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate it. Look, let's start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to start Asai Brothers. Yeah, great, mate. Um, Sam Carson, uh, 31 years of age. I uh, was a professional athlete uh, when I in my younger days. So I, I did track and field from the age of eight right through to the age of 21. And once I hit my 21st birthday, I decided to quit track and field. And, too old. Uh, <laughs> got too old and the body got too sore. So um, I started to realize that I had a lot of love and passion and enthusiasm and determination and ambition, but I wanted to put that somewhere and I and I didn't really know where to put it, but I uh, ended up trialing it in the business sector. And I, I came to love business when I was about 15 years of age when we had to write business plans and come up with ideas and concepts and, and, and potentially launch the concept as well. And I, and I came obsessed with that idea of creating something and executing something and that was about the age of 15 so so slowly started to, to to love that entire process and so by the age of 21 I, uh, I, I looked into uh, the gym sector and I became a franchisee and an owner of a, a gym out in Cleveland um, it was called snap fitness Cleveland at the time and uh, yeah, built that gym up uh, to a, a substantial amount of members uh, myself and my business partner, Ben Day, um, we found a gap in the market uh, when it came to healthy on-the-go foods, um, as well as superfoods and, and plant-based offering. Uh, we found that uh, to be quite a, quite a large market uh, where we were actually from in the Redlands area, which is just like, I would call it a small country town out mm. in the Bayside area, <laughs> uh, where nothing was really going on out, out in that space. Everyone was traveling into the CBD or alternatively, they were going to the sunny coast or the Gold Coast to get healthy food and so we thought look why don't we trial something uh here in the redlands area um and at the time we still owned our gym so between both of our gyms we had a, a few thousand members that we could potentially market the concept to uh so we started there two gym goers with no no hospitality experience trying to dive into the hospitality world is is a recipe for disaster so <laughs> we we decided to engage a raw chef she was very familiar with superfoods raw foods fresh fruit and veg um, so we engaged with her we paid her a little bit of money to create our first ever menu and she actually educated us through that entire process on what goes with what why we put these certain foods together and the reasons why we should look at diving into this space even more. So she really set us up when it came to the framework of our menu creation. So yeah, in short, uh, Asai Brothers was evolved and created because we found a gap in the market and we really wanted to provide healthy, on-the-go superfoods to the Australian community. Oh, that's good. One of the things you've covered there is you engage an external party and probably something I'd normally get to a little bit later, but you know, it's quite a common theme that engaging experts around you to support what you don't have and focusing on your own strengths um, to drive your idea forward is a, a, a pretty um, critical observation, I guess, for some small business owners, whether they're a startup or otherwise, or a little bit more established, to actually take on board and to consider. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I think uh, that's one of our biggest pros and strengths is to be able to recognize what we are good at and what we love working on versus what we don't like and what we are weak in. And the faster you can recognize that as a small business owner, even just a normal person, the, the better your life will be and the easier everything will be as well. Because at the end of the day, those people that you're palming your weak, your weak points to, they love those areas and they just make the whole process a lot easier for yourself and just makes the process enjoyable. Yeah, yeah I agree. That's right. So what did you consider pre-startup? You know, you've got a gym background, none of the food background, you're in the superfood space now. What, how did you sort of take the planning process at the start and what were your main considerations? Yeah, the, the planning started by calling competitors. Uh, we were just calling competitors and acting as customers. So sorry to all of our competitors out there. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we were calling competitors and just finding out exactly 
you know, what types of pieces of equipment they were doing and, 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 and actually using behind their counter. And, and yeah, they were really happy to, to, to be open and friendly and, and share a lot of those insights with us. We would also just visit a lot of those cafes and just have a bit of a pee-pee-boo uh, behind the counter and see what they were, see what they were doing. Um, engaging that raw chef also helped us out a lot. So we, we specialize in a, in a couple of d- different areas, Benny and I. Uh, one is overall operations, two is marketing and branding. But when it came to, so there are two strengths. When it came to the actual creation of product and menu creation, that's where we spent a lot of planning with that raw chef, mm-hmm. testing yep. and trialing and testing those products on family and friends. And you'd be blown away how honest your family and friends are when, you, when you're when you giving them food recipes to trial. Um, <laughs> a lot of them were second guessing us and going, why are you leaving the gym world? Why don't you just stay there and stay away from hospitality? Um, so yeah, our, our, the things that we were considering during that whole process was how can we create a menu that is edible that is amazing that has flavor profiles that is appealing towards customers of all types of ages and backgrounds because when you look at the superfood space when you look at plant-based when you when you use the word vegan friendly and, and things like that and raw it's actually quite intimidating to majority of the population so we we try to in our planning process really consider okay well what sort of words and what sort of statements and what lingo can we use to appeal to a larger demographic where it's not intimidating at all? We're just providing healthy food that tastes really, really good. No, that's good. It's, um, yeah, no, well said. So you, look, you're in with Ben and you're in a partnership there. H- how did you decide who would be responsible for the different aspects of the business? You've touched on operations and marketing here. Um, how did you sort of work out between you who would do what and are you still doing those things or have you sort of switched? Yeah, so at the start, when we first started Asai Brothers, it was pretty much all hands on deck. If you're good at it, do it. If you're not good at it, still do it and just see who's <laughs> better at it. <laughs> um, and that's that, that was one of the biggest things, like just trial and error and see what you love and see what you don't love. So it was very much all hands on deck to begin with. And then we started to, as we started to grow the, the brand and the business and the model and the concept and all that sort of stuff, we started to really realize, okay, well, Benny's really good at store design really good at marketing and branding the brand and i'm really good at the operational side of things the legal side of things the finance side of things we started to just fall the, uh, fall into those roles and so that was actually quite an organic process it wasn't us it wasn't like a formal process where mm. we just sat down and go you're good at this you're good at this we actually just organically fell into those two places which is great I, I, when i if we fast forward to today um i'm very much still heavily involved in the finance and the legality side of but once again we still engage high profile solicitors and high profile accountants to make sure that we are doing things correctly and when it comes to the the actual national marketing and branding and store design uh we've engaged in incredible architecture tech that helps Ben out with the store design making sure that everything is still really compliant but he still likes to put finger on the pulse and make sure that all the designs are as per our brand and as per our standards and then when it comes to marketing and branding Benny's got a really nice eye and creative eye when it comes to marketing so he's still heavily involved in that place Um, but we have just recently engaged someone who is going to help build our brand from a different profile we're very humorous and little things like that's one of our core values is humor Um, but we've engaged this uh, we've engaged this person who's actually going to help us out with just engaging with our customers a little bit more we've got a database of around 40,000 people and we're going to be doing frequent EDMs and those EDMs entail uh, it's, it's recipes that you can do with our protein powder, recipes that you can do with our coffee, uh, recipes that you can do with all of our different uh, other product lines that you can actually make at home. And so it's about b- building our brand and providing value a little bit more to our customers than just what meets the eye from our social media channels. So yeah, we've, we've stepped back a little bit, which is great, um, but we're still heavily involved because we, do just, we just love the process so much. Am I correct in saying that you've recently just launched a uh, food van, mobile food van in the business? Yeah, so we're actually launching the food truck in an area called Bansdale, Victoria. It's our first food truck um, for the brand, which is fantastic, and we're looking at rolling them out, um, obviously, yeah, pretty heavily over the next 12 to 18 months. And the reason why we created that was because we found a, a gap in the market once again. When you look at events, festivals, school fates, all of these types of events, they just have no healthy offering. And so we thought, how can we fill that void? And by filling that void uh, required a food truck. 
And so now we now that you know now we can cater for events and fates and festivals and all those types of things with healthy acai bowls, smoothies, coffee, and warm menu items. And uh, especially out here in Bansdale, Bansdale, Victoria, uh, they're quite new to this whole space. So we're we're attacking this area from an educational standpoint, and we're just trying to educate people a little bit more about uh, who we are and what we do and, and the benefits of it. Um, but yeah, that's one of the main reasons why we created the food truck was just so we can offer healthy offerings to, to consumers around Australia. But when you go to an event, you should be able to have an acai bowl and you should, it shouldn't always be a sausage roll or a meat pie. Yeah, no, that's right. And so how many um, so franchise units have you got across the business at the moment? Yeah, so we've got 18 sites around the country. We're about to roll out uh, another 10 um, in areas such as Tasmania, uh, Melbourne, Sydney and Queensland. We, we are predominantly a franchise concept. However, this year we are putting some focus on owning some corporate stores. And the reason for that is just making sure that our franchisees know that, look, we have still got skin in the game. We believe in our concept. We believe in our brand. And that way we can also start testing and trialing some new product lines as well because we're very much heavily involved in the sweet space, meaning acai bowls, smoothies, and little things like that. But we want to start dabbling in the savory space a little bit more. Currently, we have the avocado on toast, the vegan burgers, and the vegan tacos. But we do want to start looking at offering warm, healthy vegan curries and soups and all of those types of products that appeal to just a different type of customer. And when you open in areas like Tasmania, where it's a little bit colder there than it is in Queensland, you've, you've got to look at, okay, well, it's a different type of market. It's a different different type of customer. So what can we bring there that's different? Because the climate's just extremely different. So we're starting to look into areas like that. When you were thinking of franchising, just going back for a, for a second there, and I, I, I like the idea of what you're doing here by having your franchise stores and then keeping some skin in the game too. I, I agree with that. Uh, at what point did you start to fran- did you decide to franchise the business? after you'd kicked it off yeah so we were trading for a year and then we had one of our customers come to us and say how much for an acai brother store and we just looked at each other and we said well we didn't have intention of expanding but we'll get back to you so then we engaged with our 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 friend who's also our solicitor and he said look to begin with let's just see if this brand has some legs let's license the model first so we licensed the first four stores and then we start from there once we started opening those four stores we started to get a lot more interest and then it was at that point we just said, okay, well, it's going to be harder to flip 50 franchise, 50 licenses over to, to a franchise concept. Let's just franchise the concept now. So it was uh, in at the end of 2016, early 2017, that we started to franchise our concept. It's a customer-driven opportunity, and I think what we want to get as well, plant a seed with some of the, um, the, the people listening here, is that opportunities come to you sometimes. You've got to be adaptable and, uh, yeah. and, and, and entrepreneurial enough to sort of take that opportunity and use it to your own benefit. So that's a good uh, little side note there. Just, just on the expansion front, hmm. how did you approach or how have you approached the matter of funding? Because obviously this is a big area where people come unstuck. It's either a working capital issue or there's not enough funding to grow or they go to too too lateral too quickly um how have you sort of dealt with that yeah look we're because obviously we're we're rolling out franchises so you know a lot of our capital is from selling the franchises and then obviously the ongoing royalties that we have from those franchisees Um, one thing that we are is we're very controlled with our costs it sounds amazing that you want to open up 50 sites in the next 12 months but is it actually realistically achievable with the infrastructure you have, with the cash flow that you have, with the staff that you have, all of these little things that you don't really take into account because you get, I guess you get taken away with the shiny objects. And so one thing that we've been able to recognize and we recognize this quite early on is that nice, steady, slow and steady is, is a really solid model when it comes to expanding a hospitality franchise. And so, yeah, that's the way that we've been able to uh, expand rapidly is through franchisee interest, but also controlling when they open and when they start operating. I think that's a really good point. You know, it's it's um, um, scalable growth and, mm. uh, you know, that cost control understanding. So understanding what you're good at, you talk about before we talk about skill sets, you know, with your operational side and, mm. and uh, Ben and the marketing side. But then as a business, knowing what you're good at as well, knowing what you can do. And while your mm. mind wants to run 100 miles an hour, ahead you know what can the business actually deliver in the background you know we see so many businesses um get themselves in trouble because they try and grow too quickly a profitable 20 store operation is um is much better than a an unprofitable 40 store operation so 
That's, that's um, exactly right. Yeah. We look, to be completely transparent, we got caught up with the idea of opening up sites, thousands of sites around Australia and the world. Um, we got caught up in that mentality. It was, it was a couple of years ago. Uh, it didn't take us too long to recognise that that was not the right way, but we definitely got caught up in that. And as young guys, young guys and girls who are wanting to expand a franchise or build a business, it is very easy to get taken away by all of that. And sometimes you need people just to bring you back down to earth and making sure that it's a realistic outcome for you and what your goals and aspirations are. And those people for us, they were our family they were our solicitors, they were our accountants, um, and also just deep down us, Ben and I, making those, deci- making those decisions ourselves, just going, is this the right feel and fit? And if it's not, then have the audacity to say no and just stay true to what you truly believe in. I think there's some really good learnings there as well for everybody. It's, it's, a, it's a really valid point. Mate, you, you're an entrepreneur. We know you've, you've dabbled into a few different areas and you probably will continue to do so. Um, do you want to just talk us through what some of those other areas might be, particularly the, uh, the media group you're involved yeah. in? Yeah, so about two years ago, uh, I've always had a dream to have my own media company as well. Um, and that media company uh, is called Insider Media. And how that came about was I had two friends of mine who were also interested in doing a media company and they found out that I also wanted to do a media company as well. And we all caught up for coffee one day and we just said, look, I want to do this. You guys want to do this. But most importantly, why do you guys want to create a media company? And they also flipped the question to me as to why do you, Sam, want to open up a media company because you've already got a side of this trading. And so that was a really good question. So, And we all came to the, a very similar answer, and that was to fill a gap in the market for small to medium to large enterprises with great quality content. It's about teaching and educating com- companies out there to dabble in this space, create high quality, engaging video and photography content that is tailored to your audience as well as your content strategy. And uh, yeah, we've been helping, we've been trading now for two years and we've been helping companies around Australia with their content as well as their social media strategy and management. Um, at the end of the day, it sounds cliche, but everything is online now. There's still a place for traditional advertising. Don't get me wrong, it's still a very powerful place to market your brand. Um, but especially with you know the times that we're in now with COVID, a lot more people are online and they are looking at things and they're far more active in that space. So making sure we, our job is to make sure that companies are creating regular, consistent content like what you guys are doing with this podcast. It's absolutely awesome. You guys are innovating in that space. It's making sure that companies around Australia are creating regular, consistent content that is tailored to their audience as well as their content strategy. And um, that's exactly what we're doing. Oh, very good. It's very relevant. I agree. Any advice to those starting out from your side? Probably the first one would be uh, get in, get, just get in touch with with some experts, with some, you know, we're 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 in a time now where you can send an Instagram DM to someone, send a LinkedIn message to someone, send a Facebook message to someone, and uh, nine times out of ten they can be a CEO, CEO, COO, marketing manager, CFO of small to medium to large enterprises, and you can get in touch with those guys and just pick their brain about your idea, your direction, where you want to head. And so that's so incredibly powerful. Um, and, you know, I, I see it I see it now. I see uh, kids, kids of all ages, even older people, they send me a message because they see what we're doing and all this sort of stuff. And they want to just pick our brain and see how we started and see if we can give them any tips and hints. So yeah. my, my, my first tip is making sure that try not to keep everything close to heart because sometimes it just doesn't work. Um, try and put your idea out to the world. Um, and, and ask people as many questions as possible. And nine times out of 10, these experts or these people that are professionals will want to help out because at the end of the day, they were in the exact same circumstances what you were in or are in. Um, so that would be number one. Um, and surround yourself with, with a great lawyer, a great accountant, just great advisors. I think uh, that's, that's a really important point as well. Um, and just just go for it. Just try just try and give it a crack. I know everyone says that, but it, it is very true. Just give it a crack. If it doesn't work, that's okay. A beautiful thing about life is that you can trial things, and if it doesn't work, move to the next one. If that doesn't work, move to the next one. So trial and error, and that's what's led me to where I am today is simply just trialing things and moving to the next thing if it doesn't work out. And, uh, yeah, that, that's probably my top three. Oh, that's good, man. Nike said it best, didn't they? Just do it. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if we can, yeah, in short, just do it. <laughs> That's right. All right. Sam, look, it feels like this parcel's been delivered. Thanks for your time. I love it. Thanks, guys. 
I'm James Buck. Thank you for listening to Express Lane. Don't miss any of our small business insights by subscribing to the Express Lane podcast on your favourite podcast platform or connect with InExpress Australia and New Zealand on Facebook and LinkedIn. And for anyone keen to join our global InExpress franchise network or to learn more about our services, visit our website inexpress.com. Stay safe and catch you next time.